Hello and welcome back. I hope you're as excited as I am because today we'll find out how gradient boosting works. All right, we're going to work with a sample mock data set, uh, which uh, is completely made up. It's over here, but it is does resemble uh, something interesting in uh, the real world. It is based on the Dunning-Kruger effect. And in order to understand that a bit better, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to search for Dunning-Kruger effect over here. And then you'll see lots of these charts which are like U-shaped. And typically what uh, this uh, explains is a psychological effect when somebody is learning something new. Let's say a person is learning chess for the first time. At the beginning, their level of confidence will be very high. So this is their confidence and this is their actual competence in whatever they learn. It could be chess, it could be music, it could be a language, it could be anything. So at the beginning, they're very confident. As their level of actual competence grows, their confidence drops because they realize more and more things that they don't know. And then eventually it starts to grow again once they uh, become more and more expert at whatever they're learning. So that's an interesting psychological phenomenon that we have here. And so just imagine that this data set represents um, like a study that psychologists did and it has uh, lots of people uh, that were surveyed. This is their actual level of competence in a certain skill. And this is their perceived, uh, self-perceived level of conf confidence. And so it kind of resembles that curve. So now let's see how we can model it uh, with gradient boosting. So as we discussed, gradient boosting works in the following way. There's original data set, then we create the first model. Then from that, we look at the residuals or the errors, then we model that, then we look at the residuals or errors, we model that and so on, so on, so on. And then the final model, the ensemble model is the sum of all those models. So let's proceed to that. We're gonna start with this first model. And in fact, we'll have a little tracker over here at the top, which will show us which model we're talking about on which slide. So in this first case, we've got our original data. We're gonna apply the first model. And typically the first model is very simple. It's just a like an average. We just take the average of all the Y values and we get some numbers, for example, 0 0.54. And that is our model. That's all of the model. It's a very simple model. It just predicts 0 0.54 for any data point, regardless of where it is on the x-axis. And what we're going to do now is we're going to find out the errors, the residuals. Well, their errors are going to look like this. And you can see here that the, the x-axis is higher, meaning the y-axis 0 is here. So basically... Um, yeah, so the, each one of these values is the um, associated value on this curve minus 0 0.54, and that's how we get these residuals. Now we take the residuals and we put them on the left, and as you can see, the tracker has moved, so we are building model number two, and we're going to apply it to these residuals. And as for no model number two, we're going to just use a simple, very simple decision tree. Now we'll talk more about why these red lines are where they are and not somewhere else, Why how these two positions were chosen. We'll talk about that in a separate tutorial, but let's talk about conceptually what happens. So once we apply a decision tree, it um, is applied to this, to this data set, the data set of residuals now. And now for the residuals, it predicts value. So for this first uh, leaf, it'll predict 0 0.1. For the second leaf, minus 0 0.2, which is the average again. And for the third leaf, 0 0.2 again. Uh, well, not again, 0 0.2, because that's the average. And so now we can calculate the residuals for each leaf. So for the first leaf, we subtract 0 0.1 from all the values, we get this. For the second leaf, we subtract minus 0 0.2, so we get these residuals. And for the third leaf, we get these residuals. So you can see that by predicting, now the residuals are even smaller. So these used to be the residuals, now they're all getting closer to that zero. So the error is becoming smaller as we uh, add more and more models. We're not gonna stop here, we're going to continue. We're going to move on to model three. So these are the residuals that we have. So here they are, we move them to the left. And again, we're going to apply another decision tree. Again, we're gonna use a very simple decision tree with just three leaves. Uh, it'll be applied something like this. So the average here is 0 0.12, 0, minus 0 0.04 and 0 0.2. We subtract those averages to get the residuals and this is what it will look like. So there are our residuals. Again, it's getting even better. Every time we add another model, it gets even better. So now we move on to model number four. There are our residuals that we have. We're going to uh, use a bit more complex decision tree this time. This one will have four leaves and uh, it will be split like this. So the average here is zero. The average here is minus 0 0.16, here 0 0.13, and here minus 0 0.01. So now we're going to calculate the new residuals 
these ones would have you know, not changed. Uh, these ones moved over here, these ones moved down a little bit, and these ones uh, almost didn't change. So there we go. Now we have residuals level four and so on and so on and so on. We could keep doing that. Um, typically, maybe a hundred, uh, you'd have a hundred models one after the other doing this and improving. And of course, our data set is very small and the larger data set should be more sophisticated. And so if we sum this up, this was our first model. This was the original data set and the first model that we applied, the simple average. Um, and basically it's not even a decision tree, it's just one number. Uh, then after that, we had the residuals and this was model number two. Uh, so we applied model number two to the residuals of model number one. And we got this decision tree. So these numbers are, you know, like I uh, put it in for argument's sake, the 71%, 26%. That's roughly where those red lines are. Then uh, model number three was applied to the residuals of model number two. So you can see the residuals of model number two over here. And the model number three that's applied is the red and the gray lines. And uh, that's uh, that resulted in this decision tree. Well, that this this is the same as this. This is basically the, the model, and this is what it looks like visually when it's applied to the data set of residuals that we have. And finally, model number four was applied to the residuals of model number three, and that's what it looks like. And so there you go. That's what the process of building this model uh, looks like. Of course, in a more, in a realistic scenario, this is a very simplified scenario, in a realistic, hands-on uh, study or situation, as you will see in the practical tutorials, uh, the trees are much deeper. They have many more levels, many more leaves, and the number of trees is much higher. Not just four, you can go up to 100 and 1,000 if you like. Uh, it's a, it's a hyperparameter tuning uh, question. But in a nutshell, this is how gradient boosting works. Now make sure to check out these videos on the right or the full course in the description to continue your learning, and I look forward to seeing you there.